Uh, welcome to uh, our second uh, feature on nature-based solutions. The term nature-based solutions refers to the harnessing of services provided by natural ecosystems to replace or mitigate the need for other man-made solutions, particularly in respect to climate change. So for example, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and uh, probably to help us adapt to the impacts of climate change. So they involve protecting, restoring, and sustainably managing ecosystems to address societal challenges, to promote human well-being, and to contribute towards conservation of biodiversity. So in this session, we look at how NGOs and uh, government are incorporating and implementing nature-based solutions on the ground to mitigate flooding, diversify community incomes, and even protect coasts. We hear how they identify problems, potential solutions, and experiences in implementation. The session will also discuss the multiple benefits of the nature-based solutions approach and its contribution towards SDG implementation and even highlight societal co-benefits. So I'm Norizan Binti Mohamed Mazlan, Head of Conservation for Peninsula Malaysia in WF Malaysia. But to shed a light on this subject matter, we have an impressive lineup of individuals. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce the names of the speakers and I will actually introduce the bios uh, right before they speak. So we have six speakers today. Our first speaker will be Ms. Daisy Hassenberger from IUCN. Second speaker is Datuk Haji Ahmad Fazil Abdul Majid from uh, JPSM Forestry, uh, Malaysia. Uh, third speaker will be Mr. Mackenzie Augustine Martin uh, from WWF Malaysia, Sarawak Conservation Program. Fourth speaker will be Mr. Balu Perumal from Malaysian Nature Society. Fifth speaker will be Mr. Faisal Parish. And last is uh, Professor Dato Dr. Dennis Njaya Surya, whom we will be discussing further in terms of the society's perspective. So let's start with our first speaker. Uh, from IUCN, uh, Dr. Daisy Hessenberger. With a PhD in genetics, Dr. Daisy is a scientist and improv comedian whose career is dedicated to linking conservation and sustainable development. For the last two years, she has worked at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in the Global Ecosystem Management Group, bringing biodiversity into business as usual through nature-based solutions and launching the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions. So, she will be giving an introduction to nature-based solutions. Let's hear from Dr. Daisy. Biodiversity is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history, causing fundamental harm to nature and people. IUCN draws urgent attention to the nature emergency while recognizing that it must be tackled in tandem with climate change. We can address this emergency through the post-2020 global biodiversity framework with targets that add up from local to national to global levels. Together, we must halt the loss of biodiversity by 2030 and strive through restoration for net gain by 2050. The framework must be for everyone. The Rio and biodiversity related conventions all governments, the private sector, indigenous people, local communities, and all of civil society. It must clearly link to the 2030 agenda and communicate how biodiversity conservation is critical to sustainable development. A crucial ally is nature itself. We must use nature-based solutions, which benefit nature and people by protecting sustainably managing and restoring ecosystems. Fundamental to these are standards, such as the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions, which ensure that these solutions are truly effective and qualifiable. As we tackle the nature emergency together, the economy is key. We must stop investing in activities that deplete nature, and we must abolish incentives to exploit and degrade nature. Operations in sectors that can negatively affect biodiversity, including extractives, agriculture, infrastructure, forestry, and fisheries, must change 
and contribute to biodiversity. Governments are beginning to insist that companies disclose their impacts on biodiversity and the finance sector is recognizing the risk to the economy posed by the biodiversity loss and starting to charge for loans contributing to it. Investment is necessary and must leverage the achievement of biodiversity targets while generating economic benefits and conserving biodiversity. In this way, we can redirect efforts towards building economies that sustain and regenerate nature. We look forward to discuss this idea further at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Marseille, where the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework will be high on the agenda. Nature-based solutions for sustainable development. We've just heard from the IUCN Director General in his address to the UN Summit for Biodiversity, where he mentioned their need, the need for nature-based solutions to be scaled up. Now I'll run you through the definition of the concept and some of the latest developments from IUCN. First of all, this is a good opportunity to remind ourselves that nature-based solutions, while the term was coined about 10 years ago, actually the approaches that are sort of collected under the nature-based solutions umbrella have been going on for many years. Uh, there are early origins in IUCN of approaches such as forest landscape restoration, ecosystem-based adaptation, or ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. All of these approaches are gathered under this nature-based solutions umbrella concept. And so we have a lot of research, a lot of knowledge and capacity in nature-based solutions. Since the term was coined 10 years ago, we've seen a growth in the number of academic publications, the number of policy publications, a growth in the number of funding available or calls for proposals. Most recently, we've seen the launch of the IUCN Global Standard for Nature Based Solutions, which I'll come back to at the end of my presentation. That leads us to the current day, where we see a global momentum on nature based solutions, where we acknowledge their potential, where there are calls to scale it up and for increased financing. And for that to take case, we really need to be on the same page, on the same page of what nature-based solutions really are and how we can overcome the barriers to their mainstreaming. Again, to take another step backward, you know, if nature-based solutions, the approaches underneath them are old, well, how is this different than what we've been doing? Well, they share a common foundation with our conservation work in the past, which primarily focuses on safeguarding nature. And instead, they offer an additional pillar to reach, reach new sectors, new funding, uh, new impacts by also safeguarding society. And so you can see that they extend conservation's reach and relevance, but rely also on the same conservation norms and science that safeguarding nature does. But there are some important implications. And I really, a, a, a phrase that rings very strongly with us is that not all conservation actions are nature-based solutions but all nature-based solutions are conservation actions. And so in a, I, I talked about how they had additional reach or an additional pillar to our conservation work or sustainable development work. And that's because they do reach a different range of societal challenges, I should say, from the seven that are defined in the IUCN global standard, which include climate change, mitigation and adaptation, ecosystem, uh, disaster risk reduction, economic and social development, human health, food security, water security, and finally ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. Which means that nature-based solutions can ad really address or help to address a lot of our sustainable development goals as highlighted here. For them to be able to reach their potential, however, we do need to be able to understand what nature-based solutions are and agree upon that. Otherwise, ill-defined or ill-conceived nature-based solutions can water down the evidence base and confuse the business case for this approach. So, the definition of nature-based solutions. Actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. This umbrella approach of different, uh, umbrella concept gathering together these different approaches always leads to human well-being and biodiversity benefits. They're often described as no regret options. But if they're so great providing all these benefits, you know, why are they not so easily mainstreamed? 
I want to show you just one example of a nature-based solutions, which is in Switzerland, where forests have been protected um, on the hills or the mountains surrounding gray infrastructure, uphill of roads, for example, protecting both the gray engineering and the people from things like landslides and rockfall. So we have these strong case studies. We have these strong pilots of nature-based solutions. And now we really need to differentiate from the other solutions, which are just as important. Let me be clear. We need other solutions. This is not a one solution fix all, fixes all situation. We just need to make sure that nature-based solutions can deliver on the potential that they hold, like addressing one third of our climate mitigation needs. And so here, nature-based solutions can be differentiated from nature-derived solutions. This is where, for example, with the renewable energy, the actual resource is natural, wind, uh, can, for a wind farm, but the project itself or the intervention itself doesn't rely on a functioning ecosystem necessarily. And the same can be said of nature inspired solutions such as biomimicry, where we use, um, you know, um, nat natural ecosystems to inspire our gray engineering along coasts or in buildings for the well being of humans, but doesn't necessarily rely upon or support healthy ecosystems. So, to mainstream nature-based solutions, we need a global framework that allows us to operationalize and scale up nature-based solutions. At the moment, we developed the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions so that users could design, assess, and scale up strong interventions. The standard is compatible with the ICL Alliance Code of Good Practice, and it's complementary to other standards and guidelines that might already be used in things like forest landscape restoration. It was developed to really have a lot of ownership and bring together the very diverse community of nature-based solutions using two rounds of open consultation, gathering 800, over 800 experts across 100 countries. And it's made up of eight criteria and 28 indicators that I'm going to briefly introduce you to today. So criterion one, nature-based solutions primarily address the societal challenges that I've just introduced, or one of them at least. They have to be designed at scale to take into account what's happening outside of the project intervention whether that project is small, the action is small or large. And they rely upon the different pillars or components of sustainable development, whether that's economics, biodiversity, or inclusive uh, governance. Of course, there's no such thing as a win-win-win scenario, and so nature-based solutions balance trade-offs. Who has to pay today for others to, for all of us to win in the future? And because ecosystems by them definition are complex, and because we live in a very changeable world, world uh, nature-based solutions have to be adaptively managed. And finally, they need to be mainstreamed and sustainable beyond their project time frame. The standard itself, what does it look like? There's a user-friendly short booklet, which lists really just the criterion and indicators. There's an in-depth guidance bringing together the scientific background. And finally, there is a self-assessment tool which enables users to assess their adherence. This is currently in draft phase, but it is possible to use the standard now in your past, current, and future interventions. And with that, I'd like to close just making visible the different resources that are available to you and others on nature-based solutions. Thank you. So we've heard from uh, Miss Daisy Hassenberger, thank you. Uh, without further ado, we'll go straight into the second speaker, uh, Datuk Haji Ahmad Fazil Abdul Majid. So he is a director of uh, Sylvie Culture and Forest Biodiversity Conservation, uh, Division of Forestry Department, Peninsula Malaysia. Prior to his current posting, he served as director of the State Forestry Departments of Terengganu and Negeri Milan. He has been working in the forestry profession since 1991 and served in many capacities with the Forestry Department of Peninsula Malaysia. Welcome. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Ahmad Fadi bin Abdul Majid. I'm currently a division director in the Forestry Department Peninsula Malaysia, responsible for the rehabilitation and the restoration of forest areas in Peninsula Malaysia. So today I'm going to talk about the mangrove restoration for coastal protections and the outline for my presentation uh, will be a small introduction, the objective of the project, the talks on the mangrove forest itself and uh, a small discussion on uh, the issues and challenges we face during the implementation of these projects. 
So on introduction, as we all uh, might have uh, recall, uh, the project of the mangrove restoration started off uh, way back in 2004. Uh, at the moment, Malaysia has about 4,800 kilometers of coastline uh, in Peninsula Malaysia. So the coastline uh, acts as buffer zones to protect the coast from natural disasters such as waves and typhoons and also uh, hurricanes. So as uh, as record, uh, we were hit by a tsunami in on the 26th November of 2004. Following the incident, the Prime Minister of Malaysia uh, enforced a special task force on planting operations for mangrove trees and other suitable species on the national coast. So we started in the 9 Malaysia plan and continued to the uh, 10 and 11 Malaysia plan. Uh, so far, in all, we have planted about 2,900 hectares of uh, coastal areas with a number of 6,796,000 uh, trees. So the importance of the coastal uh, forest as uh, we all might uh, realize, apart from uh, being a natural protection to reduce uh, soil erosion, is also a center for biodiversity and uh, marine diversity breeding ground, especially for prawns and fishes, and also for other flora and fauna. And apart from that, it's also uh, uh, act as a place where local communities improve their social economic uh, through fishing and other food products. Uh, we also uh, we also uh, apply some um, uh, CSR with the communities to enhance the awareness towards the importance of the coastal forest. And also the importance of the coastal forest is to enhance the quality of the environment and also aesthetic values to attract tourists. So far, our yearly targets for forest uh, restoration in the coastline or in the mangrove areas is around 50 hectares a year. It's not big, but uh, somehow um, the numbers uh, really uh, shows that um, it's very important to do something about the area. Okay, this is a brief um, notes on the uh, tsunami incident in 2004, apart from Malaysia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Maldives, India, Myanmar, and Thailand were also affected. So all in all, in Malaysia alone, uh, we recorded a death toll of about 65 uh, people, uh, around 50 people are missing, uh, more than 100 people are injured, and also uh, destruction, destructions on some 8,000 uh, properties during the tsunami. Okay, uh, now we go to the project objective. Uh, there's two main objectives here. The first is to create and increase natural protection on the uh, coastal area to prevent damage by natural disasters and uh, erosion. And the second one is to establish a buffer zone to engage strong waves and winds and to protect environment pollution. Okay, what are the, the uh, benefits for the uh, restoration? Uh, first of all, we have the uh, ecological purpose, as we all know. In Peninsula Malaysia, we have a total of, of almost 105,000 hectares of mangrove in Peninsula Malaysia alone. We have uh, gathered uh, some 90,000 hectares as permanent forest estate and we are going to gather the balance of it, it's around 16,500 hectares as permanent forest estate, so that it, it covers under our Forestry Act 313. Okay, um, so the total of, almost a total of 106,000 hectares, uh, mainly mangrove in the peninsula of Malaysia. So it has um, economic values, it acts also as greenhouse gases emissions, improving uh, 
livelihood, rural livelihood, especially fishermen living around the area of the mangrove forest. We increase food production through uh, prawns and uh, fish spawning area. And then we also maintain the balance of the water and soil. Uh, increase production areas. Uh, the project also increase production areas for charcoal and also for other uh, products from the mangrove. Uh, we improve uh, biodiversity and also the, we improve the ecosystem itself, especially for uh, now uh, some migratory birds uses uh, mangrove forests as their stopover for food and uh, resting place. Okay, the mangrove forests, uh, as we look at the forest type, are mainly on the uh, coastal at the elevation of below 100 meters above sea level. Um, throughout Peninsula Malaysia, we have a mangrove from Perlis up in the north to Johor on the south. And also we have also mangrove in mangrove in Kelantan, Terengganu, and also in Pahang, in Peninsula Malaysia. Okay, so um, what are the projects that we have been doing so far? So it's a national project initiated by the tsunami in 2004, and uh, we have done the project for 15 years, covering three Malaysian plan. The first in the first Malaysian plan on the nine Malaysian plan, we spent about 38 million dollars. On the 10 Malaysian plan, we spent about seven million dollars. And in this present Malaysian plan, we spent about 11 million dollars for the mangrove uh, restoration and also coastal planting projects. So a total of 2,936 hectares of land has been rehabilitated we have it's been restored with a number of 6,796,000 trees. The projects are also being conducted uh, with the cooperation of the NGOs, namely GEC, MNS, SAM, WWF, IRIM, and also some uh, local communities, um, NGOs such as Rural Citizen, Sahabat Gula, Sahabat Kuala Gula, Sahabat Setiu, and Sahabat Bakau Lekit. So, uh, species planted during the project, namely is uh, Rhizophara apiculata, Rhizophara mucronata, Xylocarpus, and also Cachurena uh, equisifolia, which is uh, Rupantai. These uh, Rupantai are being planted on the uh, sandy beach. Okay, the importance of uh, mangrove forest, uh, mainly uh, it protects the coastal area from damage by unprecedented incoming waves. And uh, it also protects from uh, other natural disasters, uh, disasters uh, being a center for biodiversity and maritime diversity, a breeding ground for marine life, flora and fauna. It also enhances the quality of the environment and aesthetic value to attract tourists and also uh, rehabilitate coastal habitat, which act as a corridor for numerous biological diversity and enrich the coastal source uh, products. And also, um, we establish the buffer zone, especially um, where areas, where communities are living by the seaside, by the, by the uh, mangrove areas, it, 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 it acts as a buffer zone from these uh, attacks of tsunami or waves. So throughout the project, we have um, uh, produced uh, yearly reports on what have we done throughout the years, throughout 2004 until now. And we also have conducted a few um, proceedings, uh, sorry, uh, conferences, and we have uh, produced the proceeding for the conferences. Uh, we can refer to it and we can look at it. Uh, we can find the reports and proceeding in the department. We can request for it. If you all would, have, would like to have one, 
uh, there shouldn't be any problem. Just give us a call, uh, contact us, and then we can uh, share the books and also the reports. We also have some reports on R&D, especially done by the uh, local universities and also by frames on the um, effects or research to uh, upgrade the forest area. Okay, so uh, here's some photos of the project that we have done, uh, the before and after. So the outcome of the project, as we can see uh, shown here, is uh, a project in Pantai Genting, Kelantan. Uh, previously, it was bare, and after 13 years, uh, planted with uh, Ru Pantai. Yeah, Ru Pantai, and then uh, we can see the differences here. And then uh, also a project in Kelantan, in Pantai Kemasing. In 2006, it was uh, quite bare. Now it was uh, covered with uh, Ru Pantai also. And then uh, here in Jason Bay, in Johor, also. After 13 years, we can see the effects of the project. So the outcome is very promising. We hope that the project can continue in the future for the benefits of the social and economic development of people surrounding the area. These are the awareness program we conducted um, departmentally from the uh, forestry department headquarters or through the forestry uh, department, state forestry department, also in Sabah and Sarawak. Namely, it involved uh, students from the uh, universities and also from the uh, primary and secondary schools. And uh, apart from that, we have uh, close collaboration with NGOs, namely 11 NGOs, as uh, we can all see here, that involve directly with the project. Uh, we channel our funds to these NGOs so that they can conduct um, awareness program with the communities uh, surrounding the area that they have selected. Okay, issues and challenges that we face in the implementing of the project. Uh, first of all, is about the encroachment. Some of the areas are not really permanent for the state, which is uh, state land. So we have problem with people encroaching the area and um, livestock roaming the area and then damaging the uh, what we call uh, planted trees. Uh, we also have some problem with erosion, uh, coastal erosion, uh, which affect the area, vandalism, sedimentation, disease and uh, pathogen. Disease are not so uh, critical, but still we have uh, uh, cases where uh, some of our planted trees being attacked by insects and also other diseases. Uh, we overcome with our partner from uh, research and development program from the universities and also from FRIM. So they given us good uh, cooperation of how we overcome these problems. So with that, I end up my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, if there's any question uh, needed, uh, I'd be happy to answer it. Thank you. So next, um, we hear from Mr. Mackenzie Augustin Martin. Um, he is the Program Officer of the Community Engagement and Education uh, in WWF Malaysia and engages with the Lun Bawang community in the Sarawak Highlands as part of his work. He's currently overseeing the Riverbank Restoration Project in Long Samadu. Mackenzie works closely with the community to restore the eroded banks in the highlands that continuously affect the paddy fields that are mostly seated along the bank. The riverbank restoration in Long Samado is a community-based project implementing a nature-based solution approach, applying a bioengineering method that helps reduce erosion of the riverbanks in a more sustainable and subtle way. So he will be sharing with us today a presentation entitled Bioengineering Riverbank Restoration in Sarawak. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. 
Community Engagement and Education Officer under the Community Empowerment Strategy in WWF Malaysia. Being an officer on the ground, I work closely with the Lumbawang community in the Malayan Highlands, particularly in Longsmado, our focused area. The Upper Chusan River, which is located in the northern part of Sarawak, sits well in the heart of Borneo. For this topic, riverbank erosion is an ongoing battle that the community in Long Sumado are facing. The negative impact it has on the community, mostly of whom are paddy farmers, is taking a major toll, with some farmers experience loss of land, some up to 15 meters in the past few years. Back then, the community initiated a hard engineering approach by installing gabions, which was to no avail. Pomadat, which stands for the Alliance of Indigenous People of the Highlands of Borneo, requested assistance. In the beginning stage of consultation, it did not start out as a specific climate action as we did not have data on climate change. With this, we shifted on the community's concern on the current problem. That is when we got the University of Nottingham Malaysia campus into the fold. They have with them tons of um, expertise in hydrology. Throughout 2017 and 2018, a series of hydrological studies were conducted along the 5.2 kilometers um, along the, these are the stretches of the river to determine causes and extent of erosion. With the findings, a series of consultations were conducted with the community to have them comprehend all the findings and of course they recommended remediation measures with bioengineering methods mentioned and decided a large scale of um, training and installations were held at affected sites. Started out in 2019 and progressed currently. This included management of the riparian buffer zones and the buffalo fencing. Moving on to the next slide, remediation approach that we undertook focuses on three different scales. A catchment scale limits land use degradation and adds presumption against new land uses, as well as monitoring existing ones with a view to putting in silt straps in some of the worst offenders. A second long-term remediation, a river corridor scale, lets movement space of the river and also adds presumption against any further repairing clearance while observing better management of the abundant water buffaloes. Lastly, the most, the most important uh, implementation at the moment is at local scale, of which current immediate actions were, are underway, whereby bioengineering measures and repair and planting are currently ongoing. We focus more on bioengineering measures as it keeps the integrity of the surrounding nature and beauty in the heart of Borneo. It is also viewed as a long-term solution and most essentially taking account of the community's local knowledge. Throughout the process, even at this stage of implementation, consultations and discussions with the community are constant as part of the free prior and informed consent a well-informed community as well as stakeholders are able to come together to work in tandem to implement such nature-based solution to tackle the riverbank erosion. With a view of community-based project um, in mind and to instill a sense of ownership, uh, training and installation work conducted with the community members we, uh, with the assistance of the stakeholders. All throughout the process, these trainings that were done in a small scale was to help the community comprehend the setup, as this was pretty much a foreign approach and something that is a new idea to most of the parties involved in this project. As bioengineering methods require a sustainable approach, local materials were easily found abundant in the surrounding area. Also, in the bioengineering arsenal, biodegradable geotextile materials were added as part of the remediation process. These materials installed by the community are able to give the eroded and exposed banks to stabilize in a period of time. As you can see, the series of photos on the left were taken before the remediation. 
With the exposed banks, erosion continues to affect the banks, including the paddy fields along the lines of the banks, along the 5.2 kilometer stretch that was included in the hydrological study conducted. The affected areas were identified and prioritized for remediation. Thus far, with bioengineering methods implemented, the affected areas were installed out of the idea of a nature-based solution in hopes that sustainability and a science-based bioengineering approach can reduce riverbank erosion greatly. Moving on, of course, we also have learned a lot from this project as we are taking a more nature-based solution approach in no doubt, it requires a lot of consultations. Communication between all parties are essential, and there's no one size fits all, as throughout the hydrological, hydrological studies were observed. This requires constant reviews, consultations, adaptations, and changes as the pro uh, process proceeds. With the stakeholders on board, joint efforts and collaboration is essential as we rely on committee's understanding and willingness. Constant joint monitoring is added in the mix. During the course of implementation, we do experience a steady learning trend for all parties along the way. We also do see beneficial elements so far as we observe there is no erosion occurring at bioengineering sites. With the combined local knowledge of the community, and bioengineering approaches, this allows them to be prepared and understand that there is a silver lining. In part, it is also important that cross-sharing of knowledge by partners like um, the University of Nottingham, local communities, and WWF Malaysia, this could provide a positive platform in the future. Also, we observe early positive signs on addressing um, environmental vulnerabilities and climate change impacts. Before I end this presentation, I would like to give a shout out to all parties that are involved in the project, namely for my dad, for their local collaboration, University of Nottingham Malaysia campus for their hydrological expertise, um, initial funders such as CMB Islamic Bank, Alpha Pinnacle, for their biodegradable geotextile materials and consultations, as, as well as Raven Scott Forest Management Unit for their assistance. I hope this pre presentation will give out a clear picture of what we do and implement an in implementation to reduce uh, riverbank erosion. Thank you for having me and thank you again. Thank you, Mackenzie, for that insightful presentation. Uh, now we move on to our um, fourth speaker, Mr. Balu Perumal. So Mr. Balu Perumal has more than 30 years of professional experience in natural resources management and environmental conservation. He has worked at different capacities in four different environmental NGOs. And as a result, he has been involved in practically all aspects of conservation projects and programs, both in the field and at policy level. A key focus of his work has been capacity and institutional development of government agencies and stakeholders in environmental and biodiversity management. This included substantial work on facilitating the integration of biodiversity conservation issues into policies and implementation in a range of different sectors, for example, in forestry, agriculture, water, land use, and tourism. Please welcome Mr. Balu. Hello, uh, my name is Balu Perma. I'm the head of conservation from Malaysian Nature Society. So today I'll be talking about nature-based solutions uh, from the perspective of uh, Malaysian Nature Society. Uh, so we are going to focus uh, specifically, uh, you know, uh, MNS uh, uh, conservation activities in, uh, in the state of Selangor. Uh, as you know, uh, Malaysian Nature Society is about 80 years old and we've been working uh, that, that long basically uh, in, in Malaysia and especially for the Selangor, if you look at the map uh, that is uh, in the screen, you can see there are two uh, blue or 
rather uh, it, two red, two areas which are in uh, purple or blue. Uh, the one to your left is basically called uh, North Central Slang Coast, and then the other one uh, to the right is the Main Range Ridge. So you can see these are the existing uh, biological hotspots uh, within the state of uh, uh, Selangor. Uh, so those in between, uh, you can see it's all uh, very fully uh, utilized in terms of land use. Uh, so these are mainly reclaimed areas, right? Uh, so, so you have two separate regions um, which are important for biological diversity, uh, but they are not uh, connected as per se. Okay. So, so as a background, if you look into the National Physical Plan 2, you would see that uh, our forest cover has been uh, decreasing and decreasing uh, to an uh, extent that uh, our forest, natural forest area is about 43% uh, in Peninsula Malaysia. Okay, so when you look in the case of uh, Selangor, uh, like I've mentioned, um, you know, this, uh, this forested area is now uh, a, a this chunk unit by itself. Uh, they, are, they are separated and isolated from each other. Um, so the one that I, there are two IBEs, important bird and biodiversity areas has been identified by uh, Malaysian Nature Society and BirdLife International. Uh, they are the North Central Slangor Coast, uh, which is the coastal plains with mangrove forest. And the other would be the main range uh, ridge uh, where uh, Selangor State Park is located. Okay, um, so the forest reserve in the uh, in the main range are basically a protected area. Uh, they call uh, Taman Warisan uh, Negeri Selangor or Selangor State Park, uh, and you can see that area, particular area, is actually very important. As our catchment area as well as uh, area of uh, biological diversity. So an example is that particular um, species of Dutrocarp, right? Okay, but uh, when you look at it, all right, uh, although uh, most of the forest areas within Negeri Selangor comes as part of the um, um, uh, state park, okay, but there are threats Okay, to this forest and especially uh, from uh, development pressures. So here is an example where a uh, northeast, actually a degazement notice came up, all right, for Ampang uh, Forest Park, yeah, um, some time ago, um, uh, in two, 2014, where uh, MNS uh, together with a group of other NGOs including WWF, okay, we formed the Coalition for the Protection of Slango State Park and we have been addressing yeah, uh, the degradation of forest loss uh, in this state uh, since, right? Um, so we have tried a lot of, uh, yeah, we, we do press releases, we also have take on upon campaigns yeah, to save this forest, okay? Um, the other issue which is also very critical, environmental issue which is very critical um, is for us is also the air. So you can see come every August, September, yeah, the whole uh, country is shrouded by haze, okay? And the cause for this is actually um, the degradation of the pit swamp forest, okay? So some of our early works in MNS, especially uh, during the early uh, uh, 2010, okay? So this part, uh, so, so we are focused a lot on the uh, addressing the issues of loss of forest and also an important carbon sink, yeah, which is uh, called North Selangor Pit Swamp Forest. Okay, um, so one of the activities that we have conducted here is um, uh, embarking on the uh, scientific expedition yeah, to this area to provide more input so that uh, the forest can be better managed, yeah, uh, both from the perspective of biodiversity and also the carbon. Um, what's interesting about this pit swamp forest is it's actually a natural reservoir yeah, for the paddy fields yeah, that's uh, uh, along the uh, Selangor coast, right? Uh, the, uh, the famous one is called uh, Tanjung Karang paddy fields. Yeah? So here, um, the, the yield of the paddy is the highest in the country. Yeah? They do three times uh, cropping uh, and also they can uh, get at least for 10 ton of Paddy per hectare, so the highest so far recorded within Peninsula Malaysia. So the 
the peat swamp forest here actually uh, acts as a, a big reservoir yeah, that supply water, continuous water to the paddy fields. Okay. Uh, this is quite recent. So you can see the threats to this um, high carbon uh, stock area is also yeah, very eminent. Yeah? So uh, one of it is actually uh, a, a proposal to degazette the North Central, sorry, the uh, North Kuala Langat epid yeah, zone forest. All right. Um, so here there's a lot of uh, people. Yeah? There's a lot of people living around the forest. Uh, plus, uh, the our orang asli uh, friends as well community as well so so trying to save these forests uh, means not only saving um, um, the the food uh, security like in the case of uh, Raja Musa just now North uh, North Selangor Peat Swamp Forest where the water is supplied by the Peat Swamp Forest here um, is a place where the orang asli actually lives and thrives all right within the area so saving a forest not only uh, for its water, for the uh, food, food supply, security food supply, but also for the livelihood of people. Okay, uh, going towards the coastal area, um, the Selangor coast yeah, um, is also a very productive area. All right, uh, so that's also the reason why there's a lot of uh, uh, mangrove stretch is still there. All right, uh, and this actually uh, provides a livelihood to close to about. Uh, about about 800 uh, fishermen okay uh, who are basically working within zone a eh? uh, um, which which are not you know, within three nautical mile eh, from the coast they go out in the morning they come back in the evening right um, so these are all the coastal fisheries okay uh, and then the landing is also quite significant okay and it supports uh, our our food security plus it also supports the uh, economy eh, of the of the people. Yeah? Okay. So in this area, MNS has been very very active eh, in the past in in identifying the uh, bird flyways, right? To see areas where uh, you will get um, uh, migratory birds coming, yeah, uh, from uh, uh, from the northern pole, eh, going northern hemisphere, going towards the uh, Southern Hemisphere, uh, and that's the IBA as I uh, was uh, telling you earlier. Okay, uh, North Central Slang of course. Okay, and this this stretch um, of uh, uh, of um, coastal plain is also very important and very productive area uh, for the fishery sector as well as a, a very important uh, um, area for all the migratory birds. Right. Okay, so along this coastline, this is some of the work that we do. Uh, we have a, a wellness education center, which is our College Langon Nature Park, yeah, where we conduct conservation, environmental education, yeah, community outreach program. It also serves as a training center as well as uh, uh, ecotourism and recreation. Okay, uh, recently we also proposed uh, College Langon to become a Ramza site. Okay, and currently we have an ongoing program. Uh, with the local community uh, on saving the flyway. Uh, moving forward, we, uh, we we want to see that this area is also protected. Because protecting this area, uh, um, coastal area, also means uh, protecting our you know food security, uh, protecting our livelihood, uh, and also um, you know in the advance of climate change, yeah, uh, it's also to make us more resilient, uh, more uh, to, to any changes in the climate uh, caused by the climate impact. Okay, um, so in summary, okay, uh, MNS work in uh, the state of Selangor uh, has always been uh, trying to find a nature-based solution. All right, uh, to the challenges, you no, know, uh, that is in the real world. Right, uh, from the forestry perspective, like I said, uh, it's a solution yeah, for the poverty, uh, for the hungry, and also the climate change and food security. Um, protected area, like I said, uh, in the state of Negis Lango, most of the area is protected. Okay, um, but it doesn't mean that the forest um, is going to be still there, right? Because there's a lot of uh, development activities going on, and uh, more and more proposals yeah, for developments are coming up yeah, to 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 pressure, yeah, to 
to take out these protected areas for other users. Okay. Um, and you know, these areas, yeah, forest areas are also very important for our water supply. Yeah, if you look back about a month or two ago, yeah, we had a water shortage problem. Uh, not because there's not there's no water. Uh, the, the, it was the problem was the water was polluted basically. All right. So, so, so we so when you don't have these resources, right? So where do you go and get it? Yeah. Uh, so this is important uh, not only for our own livelihood, but it's also important for the economic uh, sustainability as well. Okay. And also, I mentioned about the oceans. Okay. This part of the area is not protected yet. Yeah, protected yet. But this is where most of our uh, efforts are at this stage uh, at MNS, okay, uh, to protect the coastal marine areas uh, so that you know uh, the productive areas can be maintained. Okay, then it could also supply uh, us with uh, the seafood that's necessary, as well as uh, a lot of uh, our economic activities are also centered around ecotourism as well in this area. So, so. So nature-based solutions are, are long-term solution. Right? They are not short-term solution. Okay, uh, most of it, uh, the solutions would appear in a, a long-term plans, like a structure plans, no, uh, and so forth. But it is still goes back to us to make sure that you know uh, these plans are well observed, you know, and also um, well implemented, right? Uh, so this is where also MNS as a uh, society as an NGO also sometimes act as a watchdog as well, right? And we also do campaigns, undertake campaigns, and also uh, lobby for the uh, local community participation in many of our activities. Okay, um, so working with nature uh, and people, I, I think that's the tagline that uh, that we have uh, in MNS, uh, and it's also in line with uh, IUCN's. Uh, program yeah, um, as has been stipulated okay so um, I for us uh, a framework of nature-based solution uh, would be important yeah uh, for the sustainable future okay I think that is all uh, thank you very much now let's go on to our next speaker mr Faisal Parish. So, Mr. Faisal has been the director of the Global Environment Centre, a Malaysian non-profit organisation working throughout East and Southeast Asia on forest and peatland management, biodiversity, water resources and climate change since 1998. He is a wetland ecologist with more than 35 years experience in assessment and management of peat swamp forests, mangroves and river systems. He has worked in numerous roles. ASEAN Secretariat to establish the ASEAN Peatland Management Strategy 2006 till 2020, ASEAN Program on Sustainable Management of Peatland Ecosystems 2014 till 2020, co-chair of the Peatland Working Group of the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, coordinator of the Global Assessments on Peatlands Biodiversity and Climate Change with the Convention on Biological Diversity, Contributing author to the IPCC Wetland Supplement to the 2006 GHD Assessment Guidelines. He has advised the Malaysian government on a broad range of issues related to forest and peatland management and restoration, fire prevention and control, community participation and pollution control. The title of his presentation today is Nature-Based Solutions Through Community-Based Peatland Restoration. Please welcome Mr. Faisal. So good afternoon, I'm Faisal Parish from Global Environment Center. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak this afternoon on the potential of nature-based solutions for community-based peatland management and restoration. Let me share with you the presentation. I hope you can see the presentation. So we'll be talking about nature-based solutions through community-based peatland management. So the Global Environment Center is a Malaysian non-profit organization. We were established uh, 21 years ago. We're working in all as in member states and at international level. We're specialized in multi-stakeholder approach to peatland management and restoration. 
and were appointed by the ASEAN Secretariat and the ASEAN member states as a key technical and operational support partner for the ASEAN Peatland Management Strategy 2006 to 2020. And we've been advising the different ASEAN member states and different stakeholders, including government and local communities on peatland management for the last 15 years. We're the implementer of the EFAD funded project, technical assistance and knowledge exchange for sustainable management of peatland ecosystems in Malaysia, which is supporting GC's work on NBS. So my presentation today will look at peatland ecosystems in Malaysia, carbon storage and emissions from peatlands, the potential for nature-based solutions and examples from two community-based nature-based solution projects. So peatlands are our most extensive wetland ecosystem in Malaysia. They cover more than 8% of Malaysia's land area or 2.6 million hectares. They are Malaysia's largest carbon store, storing more than 5 billion tons of carbon. They're a critical ecosystem with many rare and threatened species. Peatland degradation is a major source of emissions, unfortunately, and an estimated 75 to 100 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent are emitted every year from peatlands. The protection and rehabilitations of peatlands can therefore be a very effective strategy for emission reduction and carbon storage through nature-based solutions. So Malaysia, as I mentioned, has 2.56 million hectares of peatlands in most states, with the largest area being in Sarawak, followed by Sabah, Pahang, Johor, and Selangor State. But most states have peat and therefore have potential for nature-based solutions related to peatlands. So in the natural form, peatland uh, are covered in a dense tropical forest, and they form a very th lay thick layer of organic material or peat, which has been recorded to be up to 25 meters thick. That's the height of a 50 story building. That's the depth of carbon stored in the peatland system. So they store more carbon than all other forest types combined. They can store up to 10,000 tons of carbon per hectare compared to about 600 tons of carbon per hectare for forests on mineral soils. So Malaysian peatlands have high biodiversity, uh, such as Malaysian sun bear. And on the top right, we have one of the many endemic peat swamp forest fish species. This is Beta levida, or the emerald fighting fish, which is only known from two sites in Selangor, Malaysia. Malaysian peatlands are also important for indigenous and local communities, providing direct food, but also a broad range of other benefits, such as timber and non-timber forest products, water supply, and uh, flood control, and many other benefits to the adjacent communities, as well as the people at large. Unfortunately, when we don't look after our peatlands, then we have big problems. Conversion and drainage of peatlands leads to large scale emissions, up to 100 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year can be released through drainage, plus fire emissions of up to 600 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per fire event. We understand that more than 1.2 million hectares of peatlands in Malaysia have been cleared and drained for plantations and agriculture and more than 200,000 hectares of peatlands are currently prone to fire. Fortunately, there are more than half a million hectares of peatlands which are still in forest landscapes, but they need to be protected and rehabilitated as portions of them are degraded. What are the key aspects for nature-based solutions in peatland areas? Firstly, is to restore the natural hydrology. That is to block the drainage canals through the area and to re-wet the peat layers and stop the emission from the decomposition of the peat. Also very important, we need to prevent the fires. That will partly be done by raising the water level and re-wetting the peat, but we need proactive action with working with stakeholders to prevent and discourage the deliberate starting of fires in the peat area. 
We also need to encourage the natural regeneration of forest wherever possible. But in cases of severe degradation and burnt areas, it's not possible to have natural regeneration as all the seed bank is destroyed. Therefore, we have to replant the forest in these heavily degraded areas. Very important strategy is to work with local stakeholders, especially locally com local communities, as well as landowners and plantations in and around the peatland landscape. I'll give two examples. First, the North Selangor Peat Swamp Forest, which is in Northeast Selangor, about 50 kilometers from Kuala Lumpur. It is, covers 81,000 hectares, larger than Singapore, and is mainly forested, but there are several patches you can see outlined in red here, which have been degraded over years uh, due to drainage uh, related to logging, as well as encroachment and fires. The remaining forest is still the largest contiguous block of peat swamp forest remaining in Peninsular Malaysia, and maybe even Malaysia. It is therefore of absolute critical importance for conservation purpose. So Global Environment Center has been working with the local communities. In fact, four villages uh, who live along the boundary of the forest at the southern end, and they formed a group called Friends of North Selangor Peatlands in 2012, which was the first registered community-based organization working on peatlands in Malaysia. And the members have been actively involved in forest fire monitoring, fire suppression, awareness programs, tree planting, and ecotourism. So some of the measures undertaken include uh, blocking the drains and ditches through the forest to enable the natural recovery, uh, construction of dikes and buns in areas separating the forest from adjacent mining lands, daily monitoring and patrolling to uh, monitor for any land clearance and development and to uh, warn other stakeholders from starting fires and to actively report and take action to control fires, as well as daily measuring the water table in and around the forest to identify the fire risk. The community there have also been very active in rehabilitation uh, with engagement from the public, local community and other stakeholders. You can see here a community nursery which is set up and managed by the local community to provide trees for the forest rehabilitation action. In the last 12 years, a total of more than 150,000 saplings have been raised by the community and planted in the forest reserve areas. There have been participation by more than 25,000 volunteers in planting activities, which are undertaken almost on a monthly basis. More than 200 canal blocks have been constructed and a total of over 300 hectares has been replanted and a significant larger area has recovered through natural uh, regeneration. All of the activities have been conjunction, conducted in conjunction with the Slango State Forest Department, uh, GC, the Friends of the North Slango Peat Swamp Forest, and other stakeholders. We have also introduced the concept of ecological restoration in Peat Swamp Forest. Here you can see the picture on the top left in August 2012, an area of forest that was cleared and burnt uh, by people trying to encroach the forest reserve in 2012. And what we did was just to block the drainage canal, which was left behind from earlier logging operations, raise the water level and let mother nature do her work. And you can see in 2018, already the forest has recovered well. And now in 2020, the trees are more than eight meters tall. So that is very good natural recovery through the process of raising the water table and natural regeneration. We also have established a community sustainable peatland center or GC COSPEC, where we undertake frequent training and consultation and awareness programs with local community and other stakeholders. As a result of the work with the community to restore the forest and prevent fires, we have been successful in having a 95% reduction in peatland fires in, in the region, dropping from 1,800 
hectares of fires in 2014 to uh, around 100 in 2019. And both of those were years with significant dry and drought periods. So you can see a very major change was made through the interventions of blocking, rewetting, and active community engagement to reduce fires, degradation, and greenhouse gas emissions. Let me move to a second case study in Southeast Pahang peatland landscape. This is an area of about 100,000 hectares of forest in a broader landscape of 230,000 hectares. The peatlands cover more than 200,000 hectares, but about half of them have been developed or converted for plantations or have been uh, cleared or affected or degraded in the past. We have zoomed in on one particular area in an area called Bukit Lilao in Pekan district, where Orang Asli communities are living in between oil palm plantations and the forest area. And in this area, more than a thousand hectares of forest have been burnt out through fires which are burnt every few months. The root cause of these fires are drainage canals, which were dug originally for log extraction in the area and continued to be maintained by the plantations. And these have drained out that thousand hectares of peat, made it dry and susceptible to fire, and then fires frequently start and spread into the area. And all the forest that the Orang Asli used to depend on has now almost all been destroyed within one or two kilometers of the village. And this has been a very major negative impact on the community and affected their livelihood and welfare. So we started off with a process of free prior and informed consent, working through over a period of six months, a num large number of consultations and discussion and clarification and discussing what, what we were planning to do and how that would benefit them. We included taking key representatives from the village to visit our other rehabilitation site with community in Slangor State. As a result, at the end, we developed a joint work program. We planned together and worked together, and we got full agreement and support for Orang Asli community. And they have largely been in charge and leading the implementation of many of the measures uh, since. We had not just asking them to stop the fires, we are also looking at their needs as well. So we have provided uh, improved water supply. Uh, we have provided uh, electricity through solar power and we provided seed grants and support for alternative livelihood options, such as kalulut honey uh, and cultivation of mushrooms to provide alternate uh, livelihood from, from them uh, and also to incentivize them for their engagement in the forest uh, rehabilitation. So we have constructed a number of canal blocks, I think a total of 12 blocks, partly by community, partly by the local plantation, partly by government agencies. And that has led to areas which originally were severely degraded and burning to be re-wetted. You can see the picture on the bottom left, the higher water tables, which were brought about in this site just after a few weeks of putting a block into one of the drain. And this area has remained wet ever since uh, without fires. Altogether, there's more than a thousand hectares of peatland have been re-wetted by the block, so the area in between the Orang Asli community and the forest has much higher water table. And now the Orang Asli are also reporting recovery of fish and other life uh, in this formerly badly degraded area. So there are multiple benefits which are coming to the community from this, as well as reduction of greenhouse gas emission and the uh, forest degradation and fires. So in conclusion, peatland ecosystems are the most important carbon stores in Malaysia. Peatland degradation is one of the largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions from the forestry and land use sector in Malaysia. The main drivers of emissions in peatland areas are clearance, drainage and fires, linked often to forestry, agriculture and plantation activities. We believe and we have demonstrated quite well through the case studies that community-based protection and rehabilitation of peat swamp forests is a very effective approach to greenhouse gas emission reduction 
and should be recognized as a key strategy for nature-based solution in Malaysia's nationally determined contributions or the target Malaysia has set to reduce its emission over the next 10 years under the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. So nature-based solutions, if they're designed properly, can bring benefit to the conservation of ecosystems and rare and endangered species. They can bring benefit to local communities and stakeholders. They can maintain the provision of key ecosystem services, such as water supply, flood control, uh, ecotourism potential, and so on, as well as playing a very important part in reducing the overall net emission uh, from Malaysia uh, and therefore helping Malaysia meet its target of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions over the next 10 years by up to 45%. Thank you very much for your attention and look forward to any questions. So now we've come to our last, uh, but not least, of course, uh, speaker. Um, here is Professor Datuk Dr. Denison Jayasurya. I'd like to introduce him first. He's currently the head of the Secretariat for, all, for the All-Party Parliamentary Group Malaysia on Sustainable Development Goals, APPGM SDG, appointed by the Malaysian Parliament House on October 17, 2019. He's also the co-chair of the Malaysia CSO SDG Alliance, a member of the National SDG Steering Committee established by the EPU since 2016, Chair of the Asian Solidarity Economy Council, ASEC, Board Member of the Inter Intercontinental Network for Social Solidarity Economy, a Fellow of the Institute of International Harmony and Sustainable Development, Hong Kong, China. He holds a PhD in Sociology and was Practice Professor of Public Advocacy at the Institute of Ethnic Studies, KITA. National University of Malaysia from September 2008 until December 2019 and is now appointed as Associate Research Fellow um, and he was recently appointed as a member of the National Science Council 2020 till 2022 and member of the National Unity Advisory Council. With Prof Dato, uh, we will be having a bit of a twist, a discussion uh, with him on society's perspective of nature-based solutions. So let's jump right uh, onto the questions, shall we? Uh, and Professor Dato, Dr. Dennison, thank you so much for being with us today. We have heard uh, from the other panelists on some really interesting examples of nature-based solutions that are ongoing and have shown positive impacts uh, and multitudinal benefits to both people and nature. So we know that climate change impacts um, all society, urban and rural. But what do you think are the challenges being faced by the communities most impacted? Those who are very dependent on direct benefits of nature, for example, um, freshwater fishermen, uh, paddy farmers, and or maybe communities dependent on AI Masharakat. Okay, Th thank you for this invitation and thank you for this opportunity to share. I, I think the, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the presentations uh, so far have taken nature-based solutions uh, in, in a very good way, and it's quite illustrative of what's happening. Uh, and they have also highlighted some aspects of the community, uh, but not enough of community participation and involvement. I would think there could be uh, three areas that I could highlight, and we can take this up. and. Uh, it is indicated in some ways by the different presenters. Firstly, I think it's the conflict between the local community uh, and state governments or politicians with them and the private sector. Because very often uh, nature-based areas where these communities are dependent upon are also areas in which the private sector wants to get... Um, uh, contracted land or uh, acquisition of the place uh, for plantation development or for extraction of minerals 
uh, or building dams and other areas that come into direct conflict with the aspirations, the needs, uh, the concerns uh, of, of the people. And in that, there is the main struggle of ownership, uh, custodians of nature, uh, because they might not have land titles uh, or the documentation, but they might be customarily occupying uh, those places or might have, uh, in the case of uh, some uh, communities, um, more recent, but uh, prior to independence, uh, might have been part of that land and ecosystem. Uh, and so that conflict is a major area and contestation. And these communities are quite vulnerable and powerless uh, to take on the state whether it's the state government or other uh, quasi-government statutory bodies that might have the political cloud and the decision making uh, or the private sector that might have the resources or ability to pay the taxes or generate income and wealth for the state which the local communities might not. That leads on to the second area of the nature of consultation and partnership. Often the local communities might be called or might be informed, but not really uh, in a consultative way that they are custodians or right holders or they are owners of the land. So they might be then seen as occupiers, squatters, infringing, without legal rights and might even be forced out uh, with enforcement of different kind uh, from the land that they might have occupied for long periods of time. So this, uh, and sometimes compensation is offered, sometimes it leads to blockades, uh, sometimes it uh, leads to, you know, arrest and other forms. Uh, and, and sometimes the community is given an alternative they take it and then they suffer through the process. I think at the heart of the issue is their livelihood um, issues, their customary um, uh, ex, you know, use of the land and the resources uh, and uh, life which is uh, traditional. So there are times when state operators or public policy makers feel that the best thing is to get the people out of nature, get them into uh, other forms of life, into urban living or resettled communities, which we assume is better quality of life, uh, but it might not necessarily be so uh, in the kind of uh, things. And we are now seeing the value of uh, local communities, forest-based communities, in conservation or income generation that is far more sustainable. So the challenges are there. I think in some states it's being addressed. Uh, some agencies respond constructively, but across board, uh, this rights-based approach uh, to indigenous people or forest-based uh, people from a right to development basis uh, is not a strong, uh, 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 approach and and so that might be a real struggle uh, to see and there are enough cases on the ground uh, to show the negative aspects of our development. So Prof Dato, um, have you actually seen on the ground any examples of nature-based solutions in action uh, in the communities you have worked with uh, and visited? that the communities have put in place themselves that not only benefit them, but also maybe even downstream beneficiaries. Okay. I, I think one of the good examples that have come out uh, is um, that I've seen, I can, I can draw four examples. Uh, I know there were some uh, micro examples highlighted uh, through the work of uh, Nature Society and WWF as well. Uh, in the video presentation. I think the YKPM uh, Ulugumum organic farm 
uh, is a good option where the uh, orang aslis who were largely dependent uh, on extraction of resources from the forest uh, or doing manual work in other agricultural sports uh, started to learn the skill. The first time farmers doing organic farm uh, supported by an NGO and supported through uh, Jaya grocers in marketing and sale. Uh, so the capacity building, the, um, you know, the local, they have the land and the resources uh, and using organic approaches and making it financially viable uh, to raise uh, as a livelihood support in a sustainable way is one good example of the use of the forest and its background. Earlier tsunami project in Kampong Sungai uh, Sembling in Prai, uh, which was uh, after the tsunami, uh, where the small coastal fishermen were affected, uh, they then went on to plant with the support of CSR funding, um, I think millions of mangrove plants, and they have a, a sort of a center at the village, they do some income generation projects, but the planting of the mangroves have revived the coastal fishermen. I can get the name of the NGO, which is Penang Inshore Fishermen Welfare Association that got a grant from a Japanese NGO uh, to develop this project. Uh, and I think they planted 16 million um, uh, mangrove plants in that coastal area and as a result over the years they have been able to revive coastal fishing uh, you know because they were in small boats uh, uh, motor driven but they couldn't go into um, uh, you know the sea and so forth uh, but that has supported their income as well as uh, nature study center uh, and community women using the leaves, uh, the mangroves for jam making and things of that sort. So they are a good example as well. But the area that I did a major academic paper uh, for the UN uh, Task Force on Social Solidarity Economy uh, in Geneva uh, is the community forestry project at Gumotong Hill in Matungong in Kudat, uh, where the community through its protest and negotiation with the state government was able to get this hill uh, under a community trust, which the state government eventually did um, because of the community pressure. There was a general election coming uh, and the state government responded where there are 13 villages surrounding uh, this hill and they are responsible for the conservation of the hill, uh, the water source from the hill down uh, and no one can climb the hill without going through one of the 13 villages. Uh, but they do some extraction and those resources are used they have done very effectively honey rearing in the wild as well as uh, cultivated and the women do the marketing and the sale uh, and they have ecotourism and other projects uh, surrounding this uh, theme of conservation um, but also having nature walks so they restrict any buildings up on the hill or any construction other than a rest and watch tower kind of a thing at the top. So there are good community initiatives, but here what we have to see is where the state or the NGO or a for foreign group had assisted these communities with the resources, capabilities and support and we see local communities taking ownership, like protecting from poaching, uh, protecting the forest. They don't need guards because in the Gomotong area, no one can enter the forest 
without going through one of the 13 villages. And the villagers know who an outsider is and who is an insider. And if a truck came or a lorry came, then the villagers would stop it. And they have mm -hmm. some kind of alert system uh, on timber or other sorts of biodiversity, uh, which is quite intact uh, up uh, from uh, those areas. So we see the potential uh, of communities in the protection of mangroves or in the protection of the forest. But then it needs the political will to hand over these resources to local communities where mm -hmm. the state doesn't have money. They are then looking to these natural resources as tax funds to run the state or to run other government services not from the federal. So these, these measures uh, that are taking place, uh, we can see are good, they are micro projects. We can document it from the examples that we heard, but these need to be expanded with grassroots communities, uh, having the freedom and the right to plan uh, and using a more decentralized approach uh, by the federal government or the state government with a participatory engagement process might be the way forward. And in these projects, we are seeing the local community took ownership, but they have a partner who either financed, supported, handheld them, uh, or ensured their eventual success. Mm -hmm. But it's owned by the community yeah. is what we can see. Thank you for those really excellent uh, case studies and examples. So um, am I right in saying that maybe nature-based solutions could be further mainstreamed, uh, you know, not just by the local communities, but also by the NGOs, state government, and also federal government? Um, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, what do you think... Um, uh, by mainstreaming, what could do the designers, uh, especially you know engineers usually, because you look between, you look at the difference between nature-based solutions and traditional grey infrastructure, right? What do you mm -hmm. think designers of nature-based solutions could do to benefit communities more, especially in meeting the SDG objectives of leaving no one behind? Yeah, you, you know, recently on. Um... Uh, on, on this World Day for Cleaning, um, I, I joined the team that went to Kampong Kukup in Pontian, uh, to a Malay Kampong that is on a mangrove a swamp. Uh, and then uh, this is also educational for someone like me who's a sociologist and not uh, technical like many of the people who have been speaking, um, is actually the amount of waste that is coming through the water because their houses, half the houses are on stills. Uh, and, and for them to then see that rubbish is coming every day through the ocean, uh, and through um, domestic throwing, uh, because there isn't waste col uh, collection, because the local authority is not doing it. And these houses are constructed in a way that there is no sanitation system as well. And this Malay village is then in Kampung Kupo, is linked to a huge Chinese settlement, which has hotels, with Singaporeans coming. But fortunately at this period, because of COVID, all the hotels are empty. But in that context we are seeing now, it requires a matching of both engineering ability to see how do you maintain managing waste from the hotel side. So the Kampong side is saying, look, even if we don't throw into the, the, the water, Every day the ocean is bringing back. They did an audit uh, of where the rubbish is coming from, what is recyclable, uh, plastic from ocean and plastic from domestic and so forth. That is what they were doing on the World Cleaning Day. And I observed that local community has given up. 
they feel this cannot be solved because the ocean, I can't control the ocean. I clean today, tomorrow it comes. I put a fence, you know, a fishing net all around my house. Then when the water comes, the rubbish is outside it. But if the water levels rise up, it gets into their uh, immediate backyard uh, above and so forth. So this requires a massive uh, coordinated effort of government agencies that has the technical support and resources and civil society that have the capability to resolve this. But for the last 40 years, other than doing little Gotong Royong once in a while, there is no permanent solution to a group of people who have been living there. So what I'm then saying is it needs a match, matching between local authority, different federal agencies, different state agencies at the district and local authority level with private sector that might have the engineering ability because one side of this mangrove swamp is benefiting extremely well on the restaurants and the hotels, but they are polluting um, the shore, which is affecting the fish farms uh, and the livelihood of the fish that is being read mm -hmm. and whether it is healthy as well. So after all this introduction, I've stopped eating fish when I visit <laughs> the location oh, no. <laughs> uh, because of you know what I've been briefed at. But I, I think this is where the, the coordinated effort. So one NGO can attempt it, uh, like Heroes for Trash that were there on the ground doing it. But that needs not just community participation, but the community is saying, look, I tried, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. So where are the government agencies, where are the private sector, where are the engineers, how much does it cost to reset this so that the mangroves can operate in the way um, that is suitable for fishing, uh, protecting the coast, as well as people living their houses or houses rebuilt in a way uh, that can be sustainable. That's the challenge mm -hmm. we have taken up. Uh, it's We thought it it's a simple one, but it now looks like it's a very complicated process. And that is similar for many local communities that are faced with an oil pump project or a dam project uh, or some other development project. And they are impacted uh with the reality that they are faced with on the ground so, that was what I would thank say. you professor Dato. so i take it that we really need to look at it uh in terms of an integrated landscape yeah. approach right yeah. and that's why we need multi-stakeholder platforms yes to, and be very consultative in terms of the decision making and the vision for the landscape so that we don't leave anyone behind Yes. Thank you so much, Prof. Dato, for that. Since this is the, basically the last um, session that we have for this evening, um, I think I will possibly wrap up. Um, so what we've heard now, we've heard about how the governments and NGOs and even local communities are taking matters into their own hands and implementing really good nature-based solutions right here in Malaysia how it has also been proven to address societal challenges besides, of course, contributing to biodiversity conservation. And nature-based solutions are flexible, they're adaptable, they're cost-effective and bring multiple benefits, especially in the long term. And uh, one of the way forwards is to figure out how to mainstream nature-based solutions into our decision-making for a number of reasons, for optimization of current infrastructure even, disaster risk management, sustainable production, livelihoods, and adaptation to climate change impacts. And not to forget, in order to convince decision makers and managers of the usefulness of implementing nature-based solutions, the benefits and outcomes of these projects 
need to be measurable and verifiable to account for their relevance in relation to other types of solutions. And let's not forget the keywords integrated landscape approach. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've heard already uh, from uh, all the esteemed panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, but uh, just to inform, uh, in place of uh, Dr. Daisy uh, and also uh, Mr. Mackenzie Martin, we actually have uh, Raphael Glamet on behalf of Dr. Daisy today, Senior Program Officer at IUCN Asia Regional Office in Bangkok. And we also have um, Ms. Uh, Belinda Lip, uh, Sarawak Conservation Program Lead, and Ms. Alicia Ng, uh, Sarawak Conservation Program Community Education and Engagement Officer. Welcome. So I will proceed straight away uh, to the questions, actually. And we do have several questions from the floor. One of them I will read out in particular from uh, Inche Nick Zafri bin Abdul Majid. Thank you so much for this question. And I'd like to pose this question actually to Mr. Faisal. Okay, uh, so the question reads, Malaysia does not have a specific flood risk act, unlike the UK or the US. Um, I have been pushing this issue for so many years, but to no avail. So he says that we need a, a flood risk act of our own to become a benchmark to our flood risk mitigation proposals during preliminary design, interim and final stages. So Mr. Faisal, what would you actually say to this and what's your opinion on having our own flood risk act? How would it help us? Faisal? I think flood risk management is a key approach that has been developed in the US and UK for a number of years. In fact, the US was one of the first countries when they introduced the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968. And this act uh, zones out all of the flood prone areas in US and provides differential insurance charges depending whether you're living in a high, medium or low risk area. And by imposing high charges for insurance, you're uh, effectively discouraging people to undertake development in uh, flood prone areas and to leave the very uh, frequently flooded areas to a more natural environment or wetland system. In the UK, they have a similar act, but it requires permitting approvals for anyone that wants to uh, develop in or near a river, in or near the coast, uh, in any floodplain area, you need to get special approval from government and that will look really into the potential impacts. And all of these uh, regulation in US and, and UK are being adjusted based on the projection of increased flood risk as a result of climate change. So I think clearly this is something we very much need in Malaysia for the projections of climate change over the next uh, 30 to 50 years, we're going to see much more uh, high rainfall events, much more risk of flooding. So I think the Malaysian government needs to introduce a similar act or regulation, uh, which would uh, require and give appropriate incentives and disincentives for development activities in flood prone area or erosion prone areas along the coast. We're also faced with a, such a long coastline in Malaysia, rising sea level that many areas, we already see it in Klang being affected by serious coastal flooding. Just last weekend, there were many buns being overtopped in uh, Slangor and coastal roads being uh, flooded from the big flood events. So I think Malaysia can learn from this overseas experience and use those flood prone areas as places for nature-based solution to restore back mangrove, uh, swamp forest and other wetland ecosystem with, that can absorb flood or coastal uh, sea level rise and then uh, buffer the surrounding communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Faisal. But we know how um, water and water resources is very sectoral. Uh, people work in silos in Malaysia, right? With this act, which agency do you think, or which agencies actually would be able to um, enforce the act, first of all? And would it be very similar to integrated um, river basin management? I think it's a bit more 
specific or focused in an integrated river basin management that covers the mm. entire river basin, basically the entire land area. Um, it's more focused on the floodplain and the flood prone areas, uh, but probably overall, you would probably need the National Disaster uh, Committee or National Disaster Council to take the lead. And I think state have their equivalent National Disaster Councils, but the current setup, institutional setup in Malaysia is focused on waiting for the disaster and reacting to the disaster. What we need to do in line with the Hyogo framework at the global level is to focus on prevention and disaster prevention would mean to designate uh, those flood prone areas, discourage development in those areas, restore wetlands and forest in the coast and the floodplain areas to absorb the flood or, or protect us from storms. And that will need a very high level and strong uh, engagement, not only from federal government, but from the state governments. Mm -hmm. So it needs key agencies, whether that's the state economic planning units or equivalent in the states, as well as uh, different uh, key land management managers in the state. From a technical point of view, I think the drainage irrigation department, JPS, is a key technical advisor, but it really, they don't have any legislation. So they need to have a clear operating mechanism. And we need to put this in properly in the federal and state uh, regulations for Malaysia. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Faisal. I think this really leads on to the fact that maybe we need to, of course, mainstream um, nature-based solutions. And uh, it, it uh, goes nicely into my second question, actually, which is to Raphael. Um, with the development of the IUCN Global Standards on Nature-Based Solutions, what is the next step? to mainstream its use by governments and stakeholders to ensure its uptake. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to attend uh, this event. I, I learned a lot uh, and I took a, a number of notes, which I think will be very useful also as a feedback on how nature-based solution is, is implemented in Malaysia. Um, so the standard has just been validated in July. Um, there's been a number of, of uh, launching event, event online. Uh, with support from several governments that uh, provided uh, feedback on, on how they plan to take that uh, forward. Uh, internally, we're really in the phase of internal training. I'm just out actually of uh, uh, two days training on nature-based solutions. So uh, IUCN staff uh, in the regions and countries can be operational and provide the, the relevant support to, to, impl to, to implement the, the standards. Um, I think the next steps are, are several. If we look really at the process around nature-based solution, it's really about organizing a number of training. So we are looking at the opportunity to organize national trainings on the standard. Uh, so not only for governments, but uh, also, and, and very importantly for uh, CSOs uh, and, and communities and specific projects that are interested in the approach on, on nature-based solutions. So this is a bit on demand and, and we're looking forward also to, to working closely with Malaysia on this. Um, build also national and regional hubs and user group for, for the standards. So as uh, Daisy explained, this standard has been developed through a really participatory approach with a number of comments and participation. And we really want to keep this approach uh, as part of the government of the implementation. So there's a international committee on the standard, but we also want to, uh, to have regional and national hubs on, on the implementation of the standard. Um, so we're looking again at the opportunity of working with organizations based in each country to, uh, to help facilitate those kind, of, those kind of mechanism because it will be very important uh, to navigate from the global level to the regional and country level and vice versa. Uh, of course, continuing implementing and reporting and documenting. Um, so during the development of the standard, we, we worked on the piloting a little bit, testing. Now it's really moving to the operational phase. Um, so this is done not only by IUCN, we're facilitating maybe a process where we really rely and count on, on all of you, governments, CSOs, academics, to integrate this tool as part of the projects you're doing. Um, and if you need support and advice and guidance, we're here for that. Uh, but we hope that it's really a, a tool that will be taken, taken on board. Um, there's also several events with the World Conservation Congress, uh, hopefully coming uh, this year. That has been postponed, unfortunately, twice because it's in France and there's, there's a few issues there. Um, but that will be also the opportunity for our members, governments and CSOs to vote on a number of resolutions on how they want to take uh, things forward. Um, so if I have a few more minutes, just, just beyond, beyond the standard, I think what is important to look at is strength and, and maybe weaknesses in the region on, on MBS. Um, 
that there's a number of, of implementations that are being done currently. Uh, what is lacking is really uh, the transformative approach at scale. So having MBS influencing cross-sectorial policy. So really looking at ways to strengthen the governance. So NBS is not only the matter of ministries in charge for natural resources, but also for transportation, construction, investments, et cetera. So really uh, looking at, at each uh, country specifically and, and looking at governance mechanism that could really answer that. Uh, and this would lead to uh, national strategies, national planning. Again, we have the planning on biodiversity, on climate change, but NBS really needs to be seen and, and mainstream as something that is cross-sectorial. One important point to, to strengthen finally is also financing. Um, so uh, there's opportunities with financing some global donor like the GCF, the GEF, the MU Wiki that are looking at, at projects to support the implementation of, and demonstration of the, the standard on the NBS. But it's also very important uh, nationally and for governments to think about the sustainability of NBS strategies and how they can fund uh, those. So it's not only relying on, on donor uh, project or, or on CSO wheels and budget, but really that it becomes something that is, is seen as a, as a national investment. Mm -hmm. So that would be a few, few comments from my side. Thank you, Raphael. Um, I guess in, I think one of the weaknesses or gaps that I think in Malaysia is present is the fact that there are not many, that many examples. And uh, if there are examples, uh, are they really measurable? That's also, it. I think, uh, uh, proving that uh, nature-based solutions are really beneficial, you know, far more beneficial than maybe traditional grey infrastructure alone uh, is missing, I think. So I th um, I'd like to move on to Balu, actually, um, because uh, I think in Balu's presentation, you mentioned a framework for nature-based solutions would be needed, right? Um, what do you think that would entail and what should be prioritized first? Okay, uh, thank you, Norizan. Um, I think if you look at uh, some of the examples I've shown, all right, um, most of the uh, nature, as we know, right, uh, for certain areas, we need to actually uh, understand what are the nature that's actually providing uh, to the livelihood of the people and also the economy. You have to identify it first, right? Uh, the other thing is to value, okay, to value uh, those, uh, what nature provides, okay, and also look at the impacts. If you don't have that particular nature, what are you going to lose, right? So all this actually boils down to the healthy environment, you know, uh, the ability of the environment uh, to, um, you know, to, uh, to be resilient enough, all right? Um, in the frivolous of uh, things that's happening. Um, I, I, I like what um, the EC actually mentioned earlier. She said, um, um, conservation is not basically the nature-based solution, all right? But whatever nature-based solution is actually conservation. All right? So when you look at that, uh, MNS have been doing conservation for many, many years, all right? And uh, what we find is, when you see nature-based solution, um, this, this has to be a long-term. Okay, once you identify uh, protection, you have to have sustainability, it has to be long-term. Okay, and it has to be also uh, include, uh, you have to look from the landscape-based kind of approach, right? Or ecosystem-based approach, because you're talking about ecosystem values and services yeah, to the people and also to the environment. Okay, so, so in that sense, um, I mean, we have been working on it, but what is lacking is that particular framework okay so where's the entry point all right if you want to talk to uh, the decision makers politicians and so forth okay where's the framework okay which they can understand all right um, when ngos say things about nature nature conservation that would be their last priority for them is economic development so so the value of nature has to be um you know, have to be quantified to be able to show to them, you know, it affects the economy, it affects the state, it affects the country. So I think uh, with this uh, global framework, right, which uh, Rafael actually mentioned and earlier, uh, Daisy also mentioned, okay, so we have to bring that framework down to the country, to the national level and to the state level. So whatever we do in terms of uh, conservation, you know, uh, or, or you say specify it to nature-based solution, can be internalized, can be valued, can be seen 
uh, is intact, and also um, you know the, the returns uh, from protecting such a nature. I think it's very important because uh, even for the state of slang, like I mentioned, um, there are two uh, main nature areas. You know, as as per our identification, is the the mountainous areas of the uh, state parks, and the other one is the coastal uh, uh, fringe. Okay, but you can see there is no connectivity between these these two, all right? Um, so our last problem related to uh, water uh, pollution, you know, water shortage. Okay, yeah. actually demonstrate that no, but the connectivity is basically the river and the river basin, right? So we don't have that. We don't protect that. So we need to actually go back to look at how we want to have this connectivity. Okay, and and the same thing also. Um, the peat swamp forest is also part of that particular river, so as slang or basically, all right. So, so these are the various different nature that needs to be protected. But uh, I've given some example how they are very important in terms of uh, local economy, food security, as well as uh, uh, the community. But how to internalize it within a framework, you know? And once you have that framework, okay, how do you monitor? And how do you do your reporting? Okay, so that, that is going to be very, very important. Then how do you then improve okay, on your delivery? Okay, and basically I look forward to Raphael's uh, training on nature-based solution, basically. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Valu. I look forward to it too. <laughs> um, and you're right, Valu. I mean, you don't have to look far. Uh, in Slango itself, we're still having uh, water cuts and as a result of several, you know, pollution incidences over the past few months and it's not you know it's it's a it's a question of whether um you know if you look at the river and you actually fix what's wrong with the river look at a healthy river make sure that the water quality targets in the river are good so that all water treatment plants and water services can actually function instead of actually pouring money into um upgrading your treatment works, uh, having tertiary treatment, that's expensive, right? Uh, and that's just going to solve one problem in one treatment plant. But if you actually look at an entire river basin and you try to fix that, the multitudinal benefits is, is staggering, right? So actually that brings me to the next question, which is for Belinda and Alicia. Um, I think the University of Nottingham, uh, they did some hydrological studies along the river stretch, right? According to Mackenzie's presentation. Um, so we heard about the contributing causes of erosion. Could the problems be addressed uh, locally only, or does it need a river basin approach? Because it's quite similar. We've heard from all the panelists um, about how it needs to be approached in, in terms of a landscape approach. Um, so yeah, give me some examples, that would be good. Hi, thanks Norizan. So I'll be taking this question uh, as it relates a little bit more to the technical aspect of the study. So in terms of uh, your question of whether we actually need a river basin approach, I would say yes. From the study itself, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the causes of the erosion that was identified, they are actually a combination of factors. So it ranges from the local site itself, where the bioengineering is being done. And from that site, it's actually due to a loss of riparian. Uh, some of the riparian has been cleared and that causes the riverbanks to be uh, reduced in terms of this integrity. There are also other contributing factors. For example, they have a lot of buffaloes there. And when you have already a loss of riparian, your riverbank is already uh, reduce and then you have buffaloes trampling on it that makes it even worse but there's also the broader catchment factors the location of this river is very high up in the upper Trusan uh, river basin and the main land use in this area is actually forest which is uh, there's some timber licenses there and the community lands so there is uh, need to also address what's happening within the catchment, for example, at the logging or timber license areas, as well as what's 
happening along the community lands, which is, for example, clearing for roads um, and um, clearing in the logging areas. So the remediation that is needed, yes, it does need a, a basin approach. You need to address it at three levels, the catchment scale level, the river corridor level, which is a management of the floodplain area, as well as the buffaloes, and at the local uh, site, which is the bioengineering measures right now. And the spirit, I think, of integrated river basin management, it actually requires for good coordination and joint responsibilities. And that is what is also needed between the uh, committees and also the license holders who are sharing the same watershed there. Okay, thank you so much, Belinda. Uh, that's, that's really useful because we have to remember that uh, we have to make it work on the ground, um, really, and we have to work with all the stakeholders present there. Um, so I just, uh, another question has come in, uh, and I'd like to pose this question to uh, Dato Fazil, if that's okay. Okay, so the question here, is um, how can we scale up the opportunity costs on keeping forest rather than converting it to other land uses? Okay, thank you for the uh, question. I think um, when we talk about uh, deforestation, it's a very uh, sensitive and big issue in, in, at the moment. So as we all aware, Malaysia has a total of 53% of forest cover under permanent forest estates. Okay. Uh, so far, we have managed to avoid the area being converted into other land uses, especially palm oils and also other development. So we are keeping that 53% wholly in forest reserve as forested area. So we're going to, we are not going to convert any land within the area. As far as Peninsula Malaysia are concerned, we are going to uh, increase the number of uh, hectares in Peninsula Malaysia. At the moment, we are at 4.8 million hectares. Uh, we're going to increase that to around 5.0 million hectares within uh, this uh, uh, before 2030. Uh, so we hope we can make it. And then uh, because uh, most of the development area at the moment are concentrated in the state land, not in the forest reserve. So. As far as uh, the question about uh, opportunity cost, being a development country, I think we all are aware that we need to develop our lands for economic, social economic purpose. So that are the government main uh, concern now. So as far as uh, forestry departments are concerned, we are keeping that 53% forest cover intact uh, until at least 2030. So I think uh, that is what uh, we are going to do. As far as the opportunity cost, there are opportunity costs there, but still uh, being a developing country where we are going to increase our, uh, what we call uh, status, we need to develop. We need to have land to develop. We need to have land for food resources and so on. So I think um, uh, uh, the government are doing uh, excellent at the moment. Uh, we are not having any deforestation in the forest reserve. So we are going to keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, so I think we are almost nearing the end, probably another two minutes. Um, so maybe I can go around the room here and um, ask every everyone here to give me a call to action, maybe? Maybe starting with Mr. Faisal. Thank you very much. I think we need to focus on protecting those remaining forests, particularly those mentioned by Dato, which are outside of the forest reserves. And we also need to empower local communities to safeguard forests and natural resources. Thank you, Mr. Faisal. How about you, Balu? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the nature-based solution framework, you know, uh, has to be linked to our climate action uh, plan or program, you 
you know i i think this is where then it would really make sense from the global to the national to the activity on the ground basically thank you i agree uh dato okay thank you i think um uh nature based solution is an and uh, opportunity for us uh, especially in malaysia we have not ventured into it yet fully so uh, probably we can work on it get our nature based uh, solution in the uh, right track and then we'll work on it i think we need to to safeguard our forest areas in the in malaysia especially thank you Thank you, and I think we have a prime example with the national project Bakau, actually. Yeah, um, and how about you, Rafael? So I think one of the call for action I'd like to share is to continue your work because I see that there's a lot of examples that are already demonstrating how nature-based so solution can work, but really documenting it. I think coming back to this important point, ecosystem valuations, continuing mainstreaming the real value of ecosystem, and not only for people that are convinced of working on natural resources, but for the sector. And second, second call is, of course, uh, hopefully we can work all together in, in mainstreaming also the standard uh, in, in Malaysia. So looking forward uh, to uh, cooperation on this. Process. Looking forward to that as well. And uh, last but not least, Alicia or Belinda? Yeah, probably on more on the community's um, engagement, the community's involvement and also um, the awareness and building capacity for them and empowerment is very important um, to ensure success in natural best solution. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say a huge thank you uh, to all the panelists and speakers uh, today for this really insightful session. And I hope everyone who is listening uh, can, is encouraged to consider more nature-based solutions in whatever they do um, and uh, take away that, uh, you know, uh, it could be uh, far more productive and cost beneficial actually to, to look into nature-based solutions and not just traditional grey infrastructure. Um, so I'd like to also thank the um, organizers, uh, the MCCG and also the IGM organizers and their partners for this. So um, that's a wrap. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.